Hey, Monica, did you know it's now even easier to listen to Around the Hay Bale podcast? What? Really? How easy? That's right. All you have to do is say, Alexa, play Around the Hay Bale podcast. Playing Round the Hay Bale podcast on Apple Music. Ooh, we're really fancy now. Tune in to Round the Hay Bale every Monday at 9 a.m. Central Time. Grab a cup of joe and let's gather around that hay bale. With your hosts, Anne from Andale Homestead. Casey from Ormsby Farms. Monica from Bland's Promised Land Ranch, and Sandy from Suburban Home Center, Wyoming, Arizona. Here they are. Hey, hey y'all, hey. hey. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm Ann with Andale Homestead. Hey, everyone. It's Casey from Ormsby Farms. And I'm Monica from Bland's Promised Land Ranch. And good morning. This is Sandy from Suburban Home Center, Wyoming, Arizona. And today's topic, episode six, is tomato, tomato, all about tomato plants. And I do love my tomato plants, I have to tell you. And today we're going to talk about varieties and heritage tomatoes and determinant, indeterminate. And maybe we can even talk about our favorite tomato plants that we have. Because, okay, I'll start it off. What's my favorite tomatoes? My very, very favorite large tomato is a pink accordion. Oh, my that's a favorite cool name. <laughs> it is a cool name. My favorite small tomato is called an atomic because when it's ripe, it has reds and oranges and yellows and purples, and I love it. Oh my goodness, those are new. Those are both new to me. I'm gonna have to try that. I'm gonna have to try that. So um, I'm Ann. My favorite tomato, well, for a while, a long time, it was Dixie Red because it was so versatile and so prolific as far as a determinant type of tomato. But for taste, Cherokee Purple's got to win it for me, I'm telling you. So how about you, Casey? What's your favorite tomato? I have to say that Cherokee Purple is one of the on the top of the tops, but Jetstar, you know, I fell into the little trend of all of the YouTubers were talking about these Jetstars and um, they're early and they're very prolific too. And I would say that for my slicers and I always do an Amish paste and it, my names are so boring compared to Ann and Sandy's right now, but the Amish paste ones, when I tell you, I can't even kill them at the end when I'm done with tomatoes. I'm oh. like, all right, we're done. Thank you. It's been real. They just keep on going. I'm getting tomatoes in Thanksgiving. Sometimes. That's awesome. These amazing, amazing plants. But Monica, what about you? What are your favorites? Okay, so I am a Cherokee purple girl, 100%. Um, I like to grow indeterminate varieties that I don't realize are indeterminate until they're about eight feet tall and they're like towering <laughs> over me. And then I'm like, I don't know why this tomato plant's so big. And then Eric's like, you know, there's a thing that it's called like determinant and determinant. And I'm like, golly. And I also have this like mentality that I should, and I should, and I will grow tomatoes within six inches of one another, because I mean, what happens if the next door neighbor dies? So you got to have one that's closer. So I plant my way too close, but I love my, I love, love, love my Cherokee purple. And um, they're they're They taste the best. They have the best taste. Plus I can get Eric to eat tomatoes right out of my garden when I grow things that have a good mild flavor. And I think that's the reason why I like the Cherokee purple because he eats it. My kids will eat it because it has a very mild flavor. Um, those really strong acidic tomatoes, like my kids won't do. Now I will say that my smaller tomato variety, my favorite new one is the Porter tomato. It's developed specifically for the Texas heat and it is great. The Porter tomato is a smaller tomato. It's not as small as a cherry, but it's a good size tomato that, um, is perfect for salsas. Um, I take a bunch of them and they come in really well at like all at one time. And man, I'll tell you what, the Porter tomatoes, they're, they're small enough. You can pop them in your mouth, but big enough that you can make all kinds of stuff out of them. And I love them. And like Casey, they last forever here in the Texas, you know, you have that tomato that kind of lasts outlasts your season and you're like, okay, we're done. Yeah. That was my Porter tomato the past few years. I love them. 
That's so cool. So, Sandy, very oftentimes I have people look at me in a very blank stare when I talk about determinate or indeterminate tomatoes or acidity, um, yellow versus red as far as acid. But would you explain to us the difference between determinate and indeterminate tomatoes, please? Sure. A determinate tomato is basically a bush tomato. And most of the tomatoes are going to come ripe um, about the same time where indeterminate can go, literally, they could grow 20 feet. Mm -hmm. um, and they will have tomatoes continuously. I, I rarely do um, determinate the bush type just because I want a lot of tomatoes. Because like, let me give you a fact. You know me, I like facts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the world record tomato. The world record tomato produced more than 32,000 tomatoes. Oh, um, it what? was 1,100 pounds of tomatoes. On one plant? It started producing May of 2005, and a tomato is actually a perennial. They just die because of our weather. Um, but it produced all the way till April 2006. So basically a year it produced. And so at the Guinness World Record, 32,000 tomatoes off of one plant. That's a <laughs> lot of tomatoes. <laughs> it's like... Oh, mind blowing. And, <laughs> and tomatoes are just so versatile with all the different colors from reds to pinks, right. to yellows, oranges, whites, greens, blacks, purples, and even kind of bluish, you know, right. and depending on the tomato, it will be like Monica said, um, more acidy, more sweet. So you have to decide what you want. What are you going to do with those tomatoes? Right. Are you going to put them on a sandwich? You're going to put them in a salad. You're going to make a sauce. Casey, what do you what do you think? Well, let me just tell you, we had and we talk about it on many different episodes, but four seasons ago we had Sandy on. And this was probably our third or fourth episode of our first season. And I, it has stuck with me what Sandy had told me, because at that time I was still a, a, I considered a newer gardener. I had just moved to the homestead and I was really trying to soak up any knowledge that I could from anybody. And we talked about tomatoes. Well, one, we talked about how amazing a tomato plant is, how, how God is good on giving you a tomato plant. Okay. You plant one plant. You can, one, get plants from the sucker that you got to prune off anyways. I'm a pruner. I know it's very controversial for people to talk about pruner, not pruner, that kind of stuff. But if you prune that sucker branch off, put it in a little bit of water, you're growing more tomato plants. Now, they won't produce as much as the original one, but they will produce. Then, once you save the seeds, that one plant is giving you seeds for another billion tomato plants. Huh? So with that being said, Sandy said, make sure with your healthy plants that your root system of your tomato plant is about as tall as the tomato plant itself. That's when you know that you had a healthy plant that you watered correctly, which I remember her saying, instead of doing it every day, just a little bit, do it less time, but deep, long, deep watering. So because the tomato plant roots like to stretch out and go down and deep. So I just had to bring up that memory because it truly has stuck with me, Sandy, for the four years that I've been at this homestead now on, I got to make sure, got to make sure my root systems are good for the tomato plants. And they have been, and they have produced a ton, a ton of food um, for me and the family here on the homestead. And so that's a little tip and trick is listen to Sandy. I'm going to put it on a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> well, one, one of the things about a tomato, that stock that trunk will produce roots. So like even when you're starting your tomato seeds inside and you know, sometimes they don't have enough light and they get really laggy. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is plant them in a deeper container, cover that whole leggy part with soil and it will root itself because tomatoes have feeder roots, water roots, regular roots. Mm -hmm. And so it, it wants to survive. It wants to grow. It wants to produce. And they have both female and male parts in each flower that's why a honeybee uh, the, the design of it a honeybee can't fertilize it it doesn't need it a bumblebee can shake it and the pollen will drop down the quarter of an inch but i like to use electric toothbrush i just go on the back side vibrate it for a few seconds and you will have tomatoes like you would not believe 
That's awesome. That's awesome. Now, tell me, say that thing about the roots again. They have water roots that collect water. They have roots that um, collect, bring food in for the plant. And then okay. roots that go deep, deep, deep. They get minerals. They get all kinds of stuff from your soil. I, I never knew they had different kinds of roots. Yeah. And not I mean, all vegetables do, but a tomato does. So okay. it's... It is a fascinating, and a tomato is actually a fruit. It's not a vegetable, though um, the Supreme Court did um, classify it as a fruit because there, at the time there was a, um, a tax on vegetables, and oh. it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and they, they said that it was, a, uh, it was a vegetable instead of a fruit. Oh. So th they didn't get taxed. And there's your history lesson. Good. No, I've never <laughs> heard of that. So uh, we have some indeterminate tomatoes. Pink Cherokee. Pink Cherokee I also had as well. Or pink. Um, oh, gosh. Anyway, it'll come back to me in just a second. But the vines grew like 20, 30 feet kind of thing. And we start our tomatoes off with a post. And we'll tie them up on the post. I don't use the tomato cages. But... We had to run lines from post to post to post all through the garden so that the vines could stay up and continue to grow. So we began to grow our indeterminate tomatoes in a horizontal way rather than straight up. Because who's got, you know, 30 feet that you can do that with? I'll tell you, I'm super bougie. I know Monica will agree with me because Monica has actually came to visit the farm. And I was another one that got on the YouTube train and decided to use hog panels as trellises because I despise tomato cages. I, it, I do not like them at all. It makes my eye twitch if I see them. And of course, when I bought the uh, farm, it was like 4 billion tomato cages that this woman had used. Uh, but yeah. I, I kind of do the same thing and I try to keep it growing horizontally and sometimes it will dip a little bit because yeah. they do, they get so big. But um, Sandy, what is on when you, when you prune or cut off the top for most plants, if you cut off the top, they'll get bushier, but tomato plants are not really the same, right? They won't produce any more tomatoes. If you cut them, is, is that what is correct? Am I saying that correctly? Well, when they're small, when they're very first growing, you can trim them like that. But when they get bigger, um, it's not going to make them bush out more. They're, you know, they're basically going to be um, foot and a half, two feet wide, and they're just going to keep going up. They're just mm. crazy vining. They're they're a vining plant. It's not like um, like a pepper. It'll just get bushier. So here's a a question for you guys. Um, Peppers and tomatoes, which one has more sugar? I want to say peppers. Okay, I and tomatoes, I thought. Monica? Oh, okay. Well, she'll oh, be here. I'm, I'm sorry. I couldn't find my cursor. Um, <laughs> I think it's peppers. I would say peppers. It is. Peppers have more sugar than a tomato. When you think, you would think that because, especially a sweet tomato, you would think it would have more sugar, but it doesn't, which is a weird thing. But know. you know me, I like facts. So, <laughs> what, what's the largest tomato ever produced? How mm. many pounds or kilo, kilograms, whatever? Oh, I much. feel like I've seen this one before and I should know this. I feel like I would win the Jeopardy on this one. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so good. It, is, it actually was grown in Oklahoma, the United States, in Oklahoma City. Okay. Um, 1986, it weighed 3.5 kilograms, which is about seven pounds. Wow. Wow. Largest tomato ever. That's a big tomato. <laughs> but I like tomatoes that they're like they're. That's like a chicken right there. <laughs> well, the, the article that I read was from the UK and it said most UK babies don't weigh that much. <laughs> That's right. That's right. But when well, tomatoes first came to the um, the New World, or the you know the, the New World and over into Europe, they were actually gold and cherry color, uh, cherry size tomatoes. Uh -huh. They weren't even red ones. That's what they think from the Aztecs. That's what um, uh, research thinks. And 
the other really fun thing that at one time they brought up tomato seeds up to the space station. Oh. Canada, Canada did. They brought like 600,000 seeds. They let them stay up at the space station for a little while. Then they brought them back down and let people all over Canada grow them because they wanted to see how space affected the tomatoes. And they grew like crazy tomatoes uh, up there. It was just great. But 600,000 oh tomatoes at the space station. Wow, that is so cool. <laughs> okay, so I have a question for you. So here's my here's my dilemma. People always talk about saving seeds so you can redo, right? So people have talked about you when I've seen YouTube videos, I've seen on Instagram, you're saving your seeds, you're really excited because you want to save the seeds for your tomatoes to grow the following year. So first of all, you can't grow, you can't save or maybe you shouldn't save the hybrid tomato seeds, right? But then second of all, they tell you to like put it in some water and then let it ferment and then shake it to the bottom and you got to do all this. But I'm like, look, I be throwing empty tomato scraps out into my compost and that stuff grows like crazy. Why am I going through all the, the, the gist of uh, fermenting it and all this? Like, can I, what's the sim, what's the most simple way to save tomato seeds, like to be used for the following year? Because sometimes people make it so complicated. Is it that complicated? Do I need to make it that complicated? What do I do? What's the easiest way to do it? No, you don't have to make it that complicated. I mean, do I ferment my tomato seeds? Sometimes I do. It depends on how busy I am. But really, all you have to do is I scoop them out. I put them in a strainer, kind of wash off any of the goop, you know, and then I put them on wax paper, not on um, paper towels because they stick too much on paper towels, but wax paper or parchment paper, they don't, they'll pop right off. And the reason why they ferment is that all the seeds that go to the bottom are um, fertile, the ones that float won't make a seed so that's why they do oh. that but if you just um if you just put them on the you know statistically you're still going to get 90 percent of them that are gonna um make a new tomato um plant anyway monica so, so the fertile the fertile seeds are the heavier seeds correct that's me see i've always been a heavier girl and i got eight kids <laughs> Her tile. <laughs> oh, Lord. Maybe not. I, I always, you know, I do a, a lot of gardening things with real life. So I'm just yeah, wondering. I'm a big girl. Maybe that's why I, I, I was about to say it, it's a southern thing. <laughs> it's a southern thing. So, okay. Think, for so, real. so you don't have to ferment. You can just scoop those seeds out, rinse them off, get them all kind of de gooed, and just throw them on some wax paper. Call it yes. even, call it a day, and you're good. Now, you may get. 25 seeds and only 10 of them are fertile. But if you're taking your chances, you're taking your chances versus the fermenting will give you the idea of, okay, these really are going to work or they should because you're getting rid of the non-fertile ones on the top. Right. But That's really the statistically you should get 90% oh. of the seeds that okay. will work. So you don't have to, you know, so just put two or three seeds in the container, you know, in your seed bed, versus one, but really I just usually put them, you know, put a few in and I just, the strongest plant, I, the rest, the other ones, I just cut off, you know? Okay. So I was going to ask you that too. So when you've got your seedlings and you throw, cause I never just do one seed, I am heavy handed on my seed droppings. So if I'm, you know, plus I have, plus I have a seven year old that's been helping me with gardening. So he, my youngest loves to help with gardening. So when it's time to plant, he's right out there. He's right next to me. He's ready to go. So I'm dropping a few seeds in and then I've got, now I've got like three or four little plants. Are you cutting? Or are you pulling? Because I've seen a lot of people break apart and pull the, pull the other ones and kind of separate. But then I've seen some people just cut the plants next to, so they don't disturb those root systems, that little tiny fragile baby roots. Okay. So there's a couple ways to look at it. Okay. Um, if you need a lot of plants, then I, I like to just put that whole um, container into water. I take the plastic off or paper, or whatever you're using, um, and shake it around. And then those roots will just come apart so easily that oh. you're not damaging them. So, oh my gosh. Um, and then you can just plant them. Um, <laughs> if you have a lot and it doesn't matter, you have way more than you're ever going to plant, just take the scissors and cut them off. What that is, <laughs> I'm going. What you do? What you put them in no, water? I, I remember Sandy saying that on another episode because I do that now. Because when I have like when you get germinated tomato plants, I plant roughly about 150 
feet of tomato plants. Huh? So if I have three in there, I pull it out of the little seed starter one, you know, with all three and all of the soil, I dip it in the water, give it a little jiggle jiggle, and then everything kind of separates. And then I re, sometimes I re put them in bigger uh, cases before I put them out of the garden. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I remember Sandy saying that. I'm telling That's you, crazy. there's not much in this brain of mine. <laughs> but, well, I mean, I pull them apart, but the, what always i always rationalize that by saying well the stems will make roots too i'll just make sure that i plant them very deeply so that in case something may have been a little rough when there were two or three plants that were growing together um hopefully they did but i like the water trick a whole lot better so and i i've learned also that the tomato plants are very forgiving when with transplanting transplanting them like not all of the veggie plants are like that. Like peppers don't really like to be messed with. Uh, but the tomato plants, give them a little bit more water and sun. They'll be like, oh, hey, what's up? I looked yeah. dead yesterday, but I'm I'm back. I'm cool. But I have, I have another fact for Sandy, you know, because Sandy oh, cool. likes the facts. Okay. And we talked about this on our garden math episode, which is episode three. So y'all, after you finish this episode, be sure to go back and listen to that one. But does anybody remember how many pounds... A, a tomato plant, quote unquote, should produce if it's a healthy plant. 20 pounds. Yes. <laughs> 20 pounds. Huh? And <laughs> how I do my math now is a quart of tomatoes is usually about three pounds of tomatoes. If that if you're doing just diced tomatoes, so we're not talking about anything else. We're just talking about diced tomatoes. So that means I know when I'm putting it in that from one tomato plant, I will get seven quarts of tomatoes, wow. diced tomatoes. So that's how I plan out my garden. I find it so fascinating that that now it can produce more too. I mean, if it's not a healthy plant, it will produce less. But if it's a good, healthy tomato plant, it should produce at least 20 pounds of tomatoes in its lifetime even though we talked about we talked off air so sandy may have to repeat that for for all the viewers that um the, in the lifetime it will do 20 pounds of tomatoes which then turns into seven quarts of diced That's tomatoes awesome. fun fact okay so i have a question um when i first started in tomatoes and sandy you can help us with that and, uh, many people can maybe it was just me i don't know but i'm thinking that every question that you have somebody out there has the same kind of question i mean i just grew for the first couple of years i just grew tomatoes i didn't know that there was a difference in their flesh whether they're supposed to be for sauces or whether they're supposed to be for sandwiches and things like that can you share a little bit of difference in the type i mean there's like a gazillion types of tomatoes but what you would try to research a little bit to be able to grow the difference between the sandwich tomato and a like tomato sauce tomato. well like like Casey hit one of his favorite is Amish. And that is a perfect tomato for sauces. You, it, It's very meaty. It's very compact. And not that you couldn't make sauce from any tomato. You could. But you have to just simmer it and simmer it and simmer it. So it gets all that water um, out of there. So it gets thick. So you might as well take ones that will are, are made for that. An Amish tomato, you know, is made to do a sauce. And it has a good flavor for a sauce where okay. if you take a, a slicer and you try to do a sauce with it, it's never going to have that kind of like sharp. Um, it doesn't usually have as much acid in it. And so depending on what you want to do, like my pink accordions, they're very crazy looking. You can get them in different colors, but pink and red tomatoes especially are good for men oh. because they help with prostate cancer. Oh, and cool. so if you have that tendency in your family, those are the ones that you should um, grow because they have a chemical in there that um, helps with that. It makes it so it fights cancer. The, a lot of tomatoes are anti-inflammatory, antioxidant. They have a lot of different vitamins in them. And so like if you buy a store-bought tomato, it is bred to have a thick skin because they mm -hmm. should. Mm-hmm. You know, they pick them green, they store them, they put ethanol gas in there to make them turn red, and they're at the store. Oh. So 
even a vine riped one at the store was probably picked when it was green. Oh. And then it was, um, you, they used the ethanol gas to, to uh, make it red. That's or, so scary to me. It's just <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, all vegetables and fruit emit ethanol gas. It's not like it's um, foreign to the, it, it's just concentrated to make it turn when they want it to turn so that okay. it can go into the stores. Okay. Well, this is, honestly, this is the first time that I am making or growing sauce tomatoes. I'm growing Roma tomatoes and the Mariana tomatoes from the Survival Seeds 2024, growing Mariana tomatoes. And so, Monica, you had a, <coughs> excuse me, a question. I did. So here's what I'm thinking. I was talking to a lady a couple weeks back and she said, uh, I talked to her about different things and she asked me if I've ever grown a spicy tomato. And I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Spicy tomato. She said, I said, well, I always grow my tomatoes and rows and my tomatoes actually separate my spicy peppers from my plain peppers. Like I, I grow mine on cattle panels um, about two feet off the ground. I saw Miss Casey from Boots and Bounty do that years ago. And I was like, I want to be like Casey. So I did that. And so far it's been working for me but I've never grown spicy tomatoes. Can they cross pollinate somehow, some way to make spicy tomatoes? Has that ever happened uh, with anybody here? Have you ever had that happen, Sandy? And can it happen? Like if I have a really hot pepper plant and I grow it right next to my, one of my tomatoes, can I, can they, can I make it spicy? It can't cross pollinate. No. So I can't make it spicy. No, but the thing about plants that they're just realizing now with some studies is that um, plants can attach their roots together. Okay. And so perhaps, but perhaps what she's growing is a splice, you know, the roots have hooked together, but more than likely it's just a more acidy tomato. Okay. And so that it has that sharpness that she's probably not used to. Okay. But, mm -hmm. um, a pepper plant is a different kind of plant than a tomato plant. So because they're different species, species, right. they can't really, they, it doesn't matter whether they're sitting right on top of each other. It's not going to help that yeah. tomato yeah. taste different. They have some, some crosses, you know, um, I don't want to say crosses because they're not cross pollinating at all, but they're, um, they're similar. You know, the flowers have similar traits, but I have not actually seen a scientific study that said that they cross tomatoes with peppers. Okay. You know, so, so I think we would, you know, we'll see what the science can do. There we yeah, go. that makes sense. Okay. Speaking of science, just so you guys know, anybody that's listening in, just remember anything that we say here is our opinion. And, and we have, you know, we, we will back things up with what we know. So when it comes to like, prostate health or anything like that, please know that we're telling you what we've experienced and what, what we have and our experience and history with. And there is research out there, but we encourage you to do your research because these uh, tomatoes are great for your body. They're healthy. And they're something that if you're not eating or you're not growing, you should try because you don't have to just, tomatoes aren't all the same flavor, right? Sandy, I mean, they have some that are sweeter and some that are a little more acidic and they have such a different, um, a variety out there that if you don't like just one kind of tomato, I encourage you to try the different varieties because you may be like Eric, where all of a sudden you really like tomatoes. This is a guy that would never eat tomatoes. And you know what? He's eating them now because we tried the Cherokee purples. Right. And it, every tomato, every vegetable, every fruit that you have will change with your soil. So what my Cher Cherokee purple may taste different than ants. And there are 15,000 different kinds, varieties of known tomatoes in the world. 3,000 heritage ones that they know about. So just because you don't like one tomato, there's a lot of tomatoes out there to try. You know, if your kids don't like tomatoes, I would plant sun gold. They're orange, they're um, sweet, and they're like eating candy out of your garden. So if you haven't tried those, Kids always love them. We have tours through the community gardens and some of us will always grow that type so the kids can stop and we just hand them out. I mean, it just grows prolifically. Um, it just cascades with these um, orangey yellow um, sun golds. That sounds wonderful. 
That sounds wonderful. Well, Sandy, you are a plethora of information yet again. This has been so much fun. And there's, I mean, this is the very tip of the iceberg of knowledge of tomatoes because I'm just throwing my head over the fence and, and trying to grow whatever I can. But you have the science to back it up, which is amazing. So if you'll tell everybody thank you for being here, that would be fantastic. And we're going to close up this podcast today. Well, everybody, thanks so much for stopping in to our episode six on tomatoes. And seriously, love your tomatoes, love your garden. Um, if you have questions, let us know. Um, you can put it in the comments when you watch the, um, and listen to our, our podcasts. And we just love you. We appreciate you. And I can't even tell you how blessed I am to be on this panel of Round the Hay Bale. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. Are you enjoying the Hay Bale Topics? To learn more, click on the Linktree link to get all our product recommendations, along with discount codes and more.